Okay, well, let's, let's start. I just list here sort of what we did uh, last time, so I remind you. We talked about electron transfer and homogeneous solution, where we relate the second order rate to the first order rate by a association constant uh, that I actually didn't talk about at all, but it could be, but I will pay. And then we talked about the potential energy surface that the electron transfer rate happens on, and we talked about adiabatic and diabatic surfaces, the diabatic surfaces being the non-interacting surfaces and the adiabatic being the uh, actual surfaces. Uh, and we then got the Marcus expression for the rate for adiabatic electron transfer in which the prefactor is a nuclear prefactor of something of the order of 10 to the 13th. And from this, you, oh, I miswrote it, of course. This is delta G0 plus lambda squared over 4, four lambda RT. And from this dependence, you get a normal and inverted region. So if you plot the log of the, the rate constant versus the driving force, you find in one half of the curve, the rate goes up with driving force as you increase driving force. In the other half, it goes down, and that's the inverted region. And then we talked about non-adiabatic electron transfer that assumes that you don't always cross from reactants to products with uh, unity of, uh, probability, and so then you end up with a prefactor that's basically an electronic frequency on which you transfer from one surface, uh, one diabatic surface to the other um, that can uh, be written that way. And we talked then about the reorganization energies, the inner sphere and the outer sphere, where the inner sphere is contributed by uh, each reactant contributes its own inner sphere reorganization energy, whereas the outer sphere is a composite term depending on both of them. We wrote the cross relations and we ended with the distance dependence saying that HAB was a function of R and the normal uh, expression given is an exponential function of R. That's not required, there's nothing required about that as the functional dependence. The only thing you can say <coughs> is the HAB comes about due to overlap between the tails of wave functions. You have the wave function on, the, on one site and the wave function on the other, and tails of wave functions tend to be exponential. So their overlap will tend to be exponential. It doesn't have to be, and so it's written like this. It's written as beta over 2 simply because HAB ends up as squared in the expression, and so then the distance dependence is a minus beta r rather than, uh, so it's just written that way for simplicity. And there's been a lot of work uh, determining what the beta should be. Certainly, Harry Gray's group has done a lot of work in proteins uh, determining that and in other cases. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to take a digression to absorption spectra. And the reason I want to do that is I want to develop uh, functional forms I can then use to do electron transfer on a metal electrode. So we're going to talk about absorb. Uh, of charge transfer transitions, okay? And we'll draw our normal surfaces, and the, the charge transfer transition we're going to look at is shown as vertical, EOP, and we know that EOP in our notation is equal to the reorganization energy for a zero driving force reaction. The, um, the question I want to ask, though, is what does a spectra look like? This just tells you a stick figure that at one energy equal to EOP, you should have an absorption. But we know that's not true, that there's some distribution. And so I want to know is what is the, pro the absorption spectra for a whole bunch of different energies?
drawn like so. And if I can describe the probability of transition for the different energies, I will get the whole spectra. And I'm going to do this totally classically. And what I'm going to say is I'm going to assume that the probability for transition from this position or from this position or from this position are all exactly the same. The only thing that's going to govern the spectra is how many molecules there are at this position versus this position. And so if you have, you'll have more at this position because it's a low energy position, so this will be the, the most intense part of the band, whereas this will have fewer molecules and this will be a less intense part of the band. And so we'll develop that, okay? So this is our ground state, and E of the ground state is going to be lambda x squared. And this is our other state, which I guess I could call 2. It's not quite an excited state in our thing, but we're thinking of it as the upper state. is going to be, we drew, draw this again as 0 and 1 for our coordinate, will be x minus 1 squared. OK. And uh, I know that E op is going to equal E2 minus E ground state. OK. And this, of course, is going to be lambda x squared, uh, pardon me, well, one. Lambda times x minus 1 squared minus lambda x squared. And you can solve this for x, and you get x equals uh, e op plus lambda minus e op plus lambda over 2 lambda. It's a minus e op. OK? And since what I want to say is that the probability of uh, excitation is just dependent on how many there are, the number of uh, molecules there, which I'll call, say, n of i, will be n of i at some value x of i, well, x, call it, is going to be equal to some n zero e to the minus e at that point i over rt. And this is e to the minus, this e of i is this ground state energy. And so that's going to be lambda x squared over rt. And we have x squared here. And we have 0 e, e to 0, e to the minus lambda. And then I guess I'll write it. Lambda minus e up squared over 4 lambda squared. Can't. Writing below, halfway on the board, it's hard lambda squared rt, OK? And that all equals e to the minus lambda minus e op squared over 4 lambda rt, OK? And this is a Gaussian function. It's sort of reminiscent of the Gaussian function we got for Marcus theory. And if I plot uh, the, the, basically the epsilon, this is now going to give me the epsilon. It's going to be proportional to epsilon versus the uh, energy of EOP. It's going to look something like that, where it, maximizes that lambda. OK. And I can now generalize this fairly directly as if I want to look at for a non-thermoneutral reaction.
where the dotted line shows the thermal neutral reaction. Well, I haven't drawn it well enough to. We know that distance is lambda up there. Oh, pardon me, let me try that again, because I'm going to draw it the opposite direction. Sorry, because I want to go up. It's not a uh, thermal electron transfer reaction. OK. And we know that this is lambda. This is thermal neutral, and this distance is delta G zero. Okay. And so if this distance is delta G zero, this distance is delta G zero up there. And this distance overall I've called E op. So I can rewrite this in terms of lambda and delta G zero. And I get N0 is equal to, pardon me, NI, I guess, it is N0 e to the minus lambda plus, uh, pardon me, is minus E op. Weird. What I do to get a uh, negative sign in here that has screwed it up. I think I didn't quite solve this correctly. Uh, let's go back to solve this. This has to be equal to lambda x squared minus 2 lambda x plus minus lambda minus lambda squared. These cancel. You bring this over, it'll be E op minus lambda. So it, do I have the sign wrong or do I what do I have have wrong here? So this is gonna be come E op plus lambda equals minus two lambda x, and x will equal uh, minus E op. Pardon me, this is not minus, that's a plus lambda, isn't it? Got to actually solve them correctly or it doesn't work. Uh, over minus 2 lambda. So this should be lambda minus E op. Isn't that what I had? Over 2 lambda? Let's, because I don't want to get it in minus E, and I say E op. Hmm. And I say that E op is equal to lambda. Oh, the question is what's the sign on delta? The G, I guess. Uh, this would be, that's okay. It's going to be plus delta G zero. And then I should get, I should get, so I claim that I'm going to get, although what I want to get is not that. It's going to be uh, lambda minus, oh, 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 that's the problem. That's the problem, I think. The pro, yeah, okay. Okay, I guess I wanted to do it too simply. I think what I got to do is I got to rewrite these. So let me rewrite these. This is going to be E2 and that point E1, E, E ground state and E2. And so E ground state is going to be equal to lambda x squared and E uh, uh, E2 
is going to be lambda times x minus 1 squared plus uh, delta g0. Right? Now, if you solve it, so e op is going to equal uh, e, e2 minus e ground state equals lambda times x minus 1 squared plus delta g0 minus lambda x squared 2, and this will be uh, lambda x squared minus 2 lambda x plus lambda plus delta g0 minus lambda squared x squared. That cancels that. E op minus delta g0 minus lambda all oh, minus 2 lambda equals x. All right, so I got the same sign for lambda and delta g, which is <laughs> what I need. Okay, so, uh, so then my, uh, where I was going with this before I got uh, sidetracked, is that n is equal to n0 e to the minus uh, lambda times the squared, so it'll be e op uh, minus delta g0 minus lambda squared over uh, 4 lambda rt. And if I write it in the more standard way, I change the sign in this since it's squared, it doesn't really matter. So it will be delta g0 plus lambda minus e op squared over 4 lambda rt. Okay? Now that has no, nothing to do with anything really we're interested in unless you're interested in calculating charge transfer spectra, which is of, of some interest relative uh, to this, but that's not really why I did it. Why I want to do it is I want to reconsider electron transfer so I can write it basically in terms of this sort of distribution function of species. So I want to go back and now reconsider thermal electron transfer again. Okay, I have my parabolas. And this, as we call, say recall, was the iron 2 plus of nucleus A, the iron 3 plus of nucleus B, whereas this is the iron 3 plus of nucleus A and iron 2 plus of nucleus B. Right? And this we call reactants. And this we call products. Okay. Now I want to go back and, and reconsider. If I consider each of the species alone, what is happening in the electron transfer? This gives you is considering as a supermolecule. Now let me consider the the iron A nucleus and the iron B nucleus separately. Okay. So the iron A nucleus, this is for the A, looks sort of like that, and it has. So this is going to be uh, Fe2 plus, and this is going to be Fe3 uh, plus plus an electron. Okay? And the electron transfer, when I go from one species to the other, this is going to go from something, someplace it's going to go from an iron 2 to an iron 3. So this is A. B, on the other hand, is the opposite. Okay. And this is going to, again, be an iron 2 plus and an iron 3 plus. But this starts up there, and somehow that's going to go down here. Okay. So this is sort of a vertical energy trend. It's going to go vertically because the speed at which the electron transfer is fast compared to the motion of the nuclei. So the nuclei, you can't move when the electron transfers. And so the, the actual transferring part is, uh, is vertical. But you might ask, what is the motion here? We know that the electron transfer moves along here, gets to the intersection point, and then crosses over and comes back down. And what I say is that's going to be the motion here. It's going to move along here. It's going to reorganize itself to some distance. Then it's going to transfer. Likewise, this guy is going to reorganize himself to some other distance, and then he's going to transfer. 
and I'll call this delta G vertical A, and this is delta G vertical B. And when you view it this way, you have to say that when the electron transfers, that delta G vertical A has to equal delta G vertical B. Okay? And the probability of doing the transfer at this distance, I'm going to say, is just dependent on the number of molecules that have this distance. So it's going to be very much like an absorption that I did here. I'm just going to say how many molecules have this energy at absorption. It's going to be dependent on that. And so now I can write all that, uh, hopefully. So the probability for the A nucleus to be at Xi is going to be the total number of A's, which I'm going to throw away in a minute, but 4 pi lambda RT. Now, oh, I, yeah, I didn't go and evaluate N0, but I, if you think about N0, there's something about the integral of it, of all of the, the integral of all the N's has to be equal to the total number of N's, and if you work that out, you find N0 comes out to the square root of 4 pi lambda RT. And this is going to be e to the uh, minus. Um, so what was it? It was the delta g squared plus lambda pl minus e op. So it's going to be minus delta g vertical a. And it's going to have the lambda in it. And then it has to have the delta g, which is the distance between the minima. And that free energy distance is the minus Q E0. It's the cell potential between there. So that's going to be minus Q E0. OK? And to, to make it come out right, it would be nice if I don't do a self-exchange reaction, so I don't get rid of the driving force. So I'll assume that this is the QA, and this will be minus QE0 of B, where they may, may in fact be different. So, and this is all squared over for lambda RT and PB of XI, of XJ, we'll call it, is uh, B, concentration B all over the square root of 4 pi lambda RT. It might be better. Times e to the minus q e 0 b, this was a, plus lambda minus delta g v b squared over for lambda RT. Okay. Okay, and the probability of a transfer to a particular position I and J is going to be P, how do I write them? P, A of Xi, P, B of Xj, where there are different distances. They're, they've reorganized to different amounts, as we know they will, because they have different force constants. And the total probability of the transfer is going to be somehow the integral of Pij times uh, the, uh, for the integral over all delta G V. Okay. So that's going to give us a B, the square root of 4 pi lambda A R T. Now we've got to be a little bit careful, I guess. And I haven't been really careful. The reorganization energies for this couple and this couple, if I'm assuming 
the driving forces are different. The reorganization energies could be different. So just to keep them all separate, we should call them lambda A, lambda B, lambda A, lambda A, lambda B, lambda B, so that we have everything distinctly marked as to who he belongs to. So I have two of these square roots times an integral e to the minus uh, delta g vertical uh, plus lambda a minus minus what is it? Uh, I've gotten it wrong. Well, got it wrong. It's uh, minus q e a zero plus lambda minus delta g vertical. This is for xi squared over the 4. This is a for lambda a r t e to the minus minus q e b0 plus lambda b minus delta g v. I guess I called this b. I guess I called it this a. I didn't distinguish them with the x's. over a 4 lambda b r t d delta g v. And as I say, to have the electron transfer go so that you conserve energy, delta g v a and delta g v b have to be the same. So I can get rid of their distinguishing marks. They are forced to be the same. And now we have the integral of two Gaussians. And you can go show on Mathematica, or if you're really, really uh, good at calculus, you can show that this, the uh, integral of two Gaussians gives you a Gaussian. And the Gaussian comes out to just sort of what you would expect, because we know the answer to this is going to be a, or almost the answer, times b all times 4 pi lambda a plus lambda b rt e to the minus minus q e a 0 uh, minus e b 0 plus lambda a plus lambda b squared squared I guess <laughs> got to get the signs in the right place. Mm-hmm. For lambda A plus lambda B R T. It just comes down to the Gaussian, which is the Gaussian we know, which is just e to the minus delta G zero plus lambda squared over four lambda R T, where the lambda is the sum of the individual reorganization energy. So that somehow we can write the overall term now as distribution functions for two individuals and get them to be here. And that's, in a sense, what I want to do, because I want to go and do electron transfer at a, uh, okay. So the four pi r t came out of the, the square root. This four pi r t? Yeah. Well, when, when you integrate a Gaussian, right? The Gaussian is some width. If we write the, in, the Gaussian, it's e to the minus x squared over a. This width is, uh, what is it, 2 times the square root of a. OK? So <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> so when you're going to integrate the Gaussian, it's basically the width of the Gaussian is going to determine a lot about the integral, right? It's going to be sort of a height times a width. So that these guys, you always get forms like this when you, to normalize the Gaussian. So when you do this integral, you're going to, you're going to get like a 4 pi rt out, and it, you get a, a sum 
you have to replace these two separate things with normalized the separate Gaussians by one that normalizes the two Gaussians. And it just works out magically. That's how it works. But those four, the four pi, the lambda, RT are basically normalization functions for the Gaussian. OK. Uh, there's a difference between them. And OK, you're asking, did I get it uh, correct? Let's see, that's hard to see. Uh, this one is minus, uh, and this one is plus, because you're going the opposite direction. And so that this one should have been plus, and this one should, and now is, is, it, is it written so delta G uh, zero is correct? Uh, I think it is. I think it's written as delta G0 is correct. OK? OK. So now, this is, turns out, this is the probability of electron transfer or it's more like a rate because it has these rate constants, has these concentrations in there, but it doesn't have any frequency factor. So it needs some sort of frequency factor to actually fix it up. And so we, and we know what the frequency factor is. So the rate is actually going to be 4 pi squared h a b squared over h all times my uh, friend where I've divided out the concentrations. So this is 4 pi squared h a b squared over h times 1 over the square root of 4 pi lambda r t e to the minus delta g 0 plus. OK, which is all what we know. And this is sort of our frequency factor in some way that we have to add. OK, so now, now we want to go on to electrodes. Now we're finally ready to do electrodes. And hopefully, we'll make use of this. OK, so now let's think about our metal electrode. Here's our metal electrode. OK, and the metal electrode has a whole bunch of energy levels in it. Right, it's filled, it has a whole bunch of, and they're filled up to some level here. So they're all filled where this is the Fermi level. Actually, I promised I'd write the energies as a script E. Where is potentials as a non-script? To try to. What you will see is there is a great there's a great propensity to become confused between potentials and energies. And now we're going to so we're going to think of some energy level EI, and that's going to be real, have a potential of minus Q EI. Okay. And when we put this in a solution, the, so, the solution is going to have some uh, potential. And when it comes to equilibrium, it's, you will have the potential of the solution equal to the Fermi level of the metal. They will come to equilibrium. We know that. And there's going to be some other position of the QE0. If the concentration of the species in solution, the oxidant and the reductant are equal, these will be the same place, but they don't have to be. And we want to ask about the electron transfer, like so. OK? And we're going to assume that this redox couple is in a solution that has a high ionic strength, so it's uh, basically outside of the drop of the potential in the solution. 
So we don't have to correct for that. That could be corrected for, but we don't want to correct for it. So we'll assume it's all outside of that. Um, and what we're doing is we're going to transfer an electron to or from this band structure. And I guess what we are going to do is assume that Marcus theory uh, works. We're going to assume that Marcus theory is the correct description for the microscopic description of electron transfer. And now we want to write a rate constant. So I'm going to say my rate constant, k, is going to be my 4 pi squared h, h a b squared, all times some integral of a distribution function for the uh, bands of the electrode that have some uh, energy epsilon, and times a distribution function for the, the redox species. Uh, how come I can't keep track of that eraser? Integrated over all energies. And the question is, what are we going to write for the various uh, distribution functions? OK. Now, the first thing we, I guess, need to ask is, what is going to be the reorganization energy of the metal electrode? Does the metal electrode reorganize? We're going to put one more electron in, or take one electron out, of the metal electrode. But the metal electrode has a band structure. And that band structure is, is dispersed over all the, ele all the atoms in the, the electrode. So there's basically 10 to the 23rd atoms that we have this electronic structure separated over. And so the amount that's going to affect any individual atom is minuscule, and so you aren't going to expect there to be any bond distance changes in the metal electrode. So we will assume that the reorganization energy for the electrode is zero, that there's no. So the only thing we need to then say is, what's the probability of getting an electron out of there, and how, what's its the, the number of states? And so we're going to assume that there's a density of states here, rho. That's a function of energy. That tells us how many, how many states you have per EV, and it's going to be a function of that. So we're going to have a row of E times the Fermi function, which tells us the probability that an electron will be occupying the state. Remember, these states aren't really all filled, and these are all really all empty. It's some sort of Fermi function that basically goes from 1, that these are filled, to 0 up here. So we need to write some sort of Fermi function. That's a function of the energy 2. And that Fermi function we have to worry about is whether we're transferring an electron out of the electrode, and that's going to be the, the Fermi function for the, uh, unoccup pardon, for the occupied states. Or if you're transferring it into the electrode, it's going to be the Fermi function for the unoccupied state. So for our Fermi function, for um, our, our filled states, which I'll call F, which is going to be 1 over 1 plus exp to the ei minus ef over rt, where this is the energy of the Fermi level and the energy of the ith uh, level that we're considering, or in terms of potential, which is what I, it's going to be minus q times ei minus ef over rt. OK, and the Fermi function for the empty bands is going to be uh, just equal to 1 minus the Fermi function for the filled bands, which ends up as e to the minus q ei minus ef all over rt divided by 1 plus OK. 
so now so now we have the distribution functions for the b the the distribution functions for the uh, oxidant of course we've sort of written a bunch of times before and we're going to write it as exp to the minus lambda plus delta g zero squared over four lambda rt okay which we've written before it's this function where the the e zero is for the the uh, redox species in solution and the vertical energy is basically the uh, q e i for this band okay so now i can write the whole rate constant K equals 4 pi. Uh, I guess there's actually there's a 1 over the 4 pi lambda RT, which I left out. It's 4 pi over H, HAV squared, all over the square root of 4 pi lambda RT times the integral of rho of epsilon over... Okay, I guess we now have to decide which one we're talking about, and I'm going to talk about the transfer from the electrode to the redox couple. You could write either one. Uh, they'll they come out clearly somewhat different, but basically the same thing. Okay. So now what do we have? Okay. What do we have? This is going to be d e. Now the que e i. Now the question is where the e i dependence you see here, but it's actually also in here because delta g zero is going. We are going from this state to this state, so it's minus q e zero minus or minus q. E i, so this is minus q e zero minus e i. So we have a dependence of e i in the delta g zero. We have a dependence of e i here in the Fermi function, and you could even think that we might have a dependence in rho. In general, what we're going to consider is that rho is the density of states is constant enough. Now, but let's look at what we have a second what we have this part is a gaussian right so i'm going to draw him as a gaussian okay and where does he peak well he's going to peak well maybe i should write him out my gaussian is looks like exp of minus lambda minus q e0 minus e i squared over 4 lambda r t. And the Gaussian peaks where this is 0, so my lambda minus q e 0 minus e i is equal to 0. That's where it peaks. So I can say q e i is equal to, uh, what's it? It's Let's see if I can solve it so I get it actually right. Uh, this has to come across, so it's going to be minus q e0 plus lambda. Okay, so if I'm plotting this is my energy ei up here, this point 
is going to be minus q e zero plus lambda. Yeah, I don't think that's right. You don't think it's right. It should be q e zero plus lambda. Mm, when I multiply through here, it's and then you say I have to take this to the other side and make this minus. Yeah. I'm sure that's uh, what I want to do. Oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, that's what I want to do. You're, you, it's, it's, a, it's a problem of uh, the potentials and energy. If I look at energies, right, these are energies now. These are energy terms. This is in terms of potential. If I'm plotting it in terms of energy, so I want it to be minus QEI going up. So high energy is over here. Low energy is over here. High, ne high negative potential is up here. Uh, <laughs> so on and so forth. So I get, in terms of, in terms of energy, there's minus QE0 plus lambda. OK? And that's where my peak is. My Fermi function, however, goes through a transition. And it goes through a transition where this is equal to 0. And so that's where Q minus Q EI minus EF is equal to 0. And so minus Q EI will equal uh, minus Q EF. OK? And so this goes through a transition like this, where this is minus Q EF. OK? Now, what we want is the overlap between these, right? So it's clear how I've drawn it now that there's very little overlap, and the rate you're going to get is very small. As I move the Fermi level up, the overlap becomes more and more, and I get a bigger and bigger rate. Right? Now, what does it mean to be moving the Fermi level up? The Fermi level is the level that is, the, is in, in the electrode. And when I'm not at equilibrium, if I apply a potential to the electrode, I can push this up, and then I have current flow precisely because the forward rate is faster than the backward rate. And so I can push, by pushing the Fermi level up, I actually push the rate up. In other words, the higher I push this Fermi level, the bigger the rate I get to my solution level. And that's because I'm, po in a sense, populating this much more. And clearly, when I push the Fermi level up here, so this is a full population, I'm getting as fast a rate as I can get. And so once I get up here, if I push the potential up higher, I never get any increase in rate. So what do I expect in terms of uh, rate constant versus uh, minus QEF? OK. When I'm down here, I have a very low rate. And something happens, but probably not too much. Then I come over into the tail, and I really start catching some of the density, and the rate starts to go up. And then I get past the peak, and it flattens out. OK. Now. Uh, OK, I think the question that I want to then address is why that happens and what is, can we understand about the electrodes versus 
normal solution, normal redox species in solution. Here's my electrode again with all my levels. I draw some sort of uh, Fermi function where this is 1 and this is 0. I f draw my minus q e 0. And this is uh, well, this is energy in that direction. And uh, I want to draw my Gaussian here on my electrode. And he's displaced from QE0 by plus lambda. So I draw him where this distance is lambda. OK? And basically, if I think of it in terms of like a solution, where in solution I have one redox couple transferring an electron to another redox couple from his half cell potential to his half cell potential. And so I think of it as that I have rates that transfer, say, from this level to that guy, from this level to that guy, and from this level to that guy, right? This guy will have a very small rate because the reaction is uphill. The, he has plenty of population, but the reaction is uphill, and so there's not much reaction. This guy will have a pretty good rate because he's pretty much thermoneutral. So the Gaussian is a uh, reasonable size, but his Fermi function is about half because it's about at the transition. And this guy will have a little rate again because he has very little population because the Fermi function is zero, but his driving force is good, and so he'd have a good rate there. On the other hand, now if I push the Fermi function up, This guy has a very good rate. This guy still doesn't. Well, let me go push the Fermi function way up. Now, well, OK. So now, this guy has a really good rate because he has some favorable driving force. And that favorable driving force is going to give you a favorable term turn term here, that's a negative term that's going to be lambda minus that, that favorable energy transfer that makes this small. So this term here is very, very favorable. Okay? And now we're driving the reaction as fast as we can go, because this is a really good rate. When we push the rate up even further, now I've got to draw it again because I don't have room to do that. This is my QE is 0. My Fermi function now is going to look like this. And I ask about the rate here. OK, what is that rate? Is that rate going to be big or little? Big, little. Well, we got both in a meeting. It's, it has a really big driving force. So what has happened here? This has become a very big negative number. When that becomes a very big negative number, it becomes larger than lambda, and it becomes inverted. So the rate goes down. So this guy has a slow rate, OK? But there's always a guy down here now who has just the optimal rate. His delta G is just enough to wipe out the reorganization energy, making it zero. So this rate is now fast. So you still get a fast overall rate. So in this case, it was this one that was fast. As you push it up, the top one is no longer fast, but you still have somebody in there who's fast. So that on a metal electrode, 
when you push the potential at a metal electrode up, the rate goes up and up, but ultimately limits. You never see the inverted region because you have lots of levels, and you always have a level then, once you fill your, your potentials high enough, that is an optimum, even though you have some that are not optimum. OK. Now I want to draw the other half of the picture. Now we want to ask about going the other direction. Uh, uh, we're going to need this again, too. OK. But OK. Now, where's the equations to go the other direction? OK. Uh, OK, let's, let's write our equations again. We have. The rate, uh, which one did I wrote? The rate, uh, I call it uh, from the band structure to the oxidized molecule. And I wrote it is 4 pi squared H, H A B squared all over the square root of 4 lambda pi lambda R T. Uh, times an integral of rho e to the minus uh, lambda minus q e0 minus e. We'll just leave it as e, because that's the e of the electrode. It could be e. I could write it as e applied or something, but we'll give uh, squared over 4 lambda rt divided by 1 plus e to the minus q e i minus e of the electrode all over r t is d e i uh, is e i this is e i this is Yeah, that's EI. Is that right? Everybody agree? And then I can go back and I can write the other one from the reduced to the band structure. That's all easy. And this part is easy. And the distribution function is e to the minus lambda. And since it's going the opposite direction, I got to change the sign on delta g. So this is going to be plus q e0 minus ei squared over 4 lambda rt. OK. So we had our picture over here where the Fermi function changes at EF, and this changes at E Q E 0 plus lambda. And I'm going to ask now where this changes. That's because I want to draw the same picture now for this guy. And this is going to be minus Q E I increases, becomes more negative in that way, or positive energy. And this is going to peak where lambda plus Q E0 minus EI equals 0, or minus Q EI will equal minus Q E0 minus lambda. So this is at minus Q E0 minus lambda. And this Fermi function makes the same transition at the same place, only instead of coming down, it goes up. So now you have something that goes 
where this is minus q e, as I'm calling it now, rather than ef. OK, so to, to draw my picture on my electrode, so now to make a, uh, here are my levels. Here's uh, minus uh, QE. We're going to draw to equilibrium. We'll assume that ox equals red. So this will be minus QE0, which equals minus Q E of the solution, right? And then you're going to get one guy who looks like this, one guy who looks like this, this distance is going to be 2 lambda. So this is going to be a lambda negative in energy, and this will be a lambda positive in energy. And when we transfer from some level uh, minus QEI here, we're going to be transferring into this one, and this guy we're transferring out of. OK? Now, that's the Garisher model. You, you draw distribution functions for the species on the electrode, and you look at the rate of electron transfer. It all is basically a sort of Marcus theory that is redone for uh, electrodes. Uh, OK. What more do I need to do there? I guess that's as much as we need to do in pictures. So now uh, what I want to do is I want to get the standard rate constant for it, the rate constant that applies when you have, oh, I have a nice clean board, uh, have a driving force set equal, well, OK, I'll tell you. OK, so we're going to get the standard rate constant. which is going to be k0. And that's going to be, so we have k equals 4 pi squared h, h a b squared over the square root of 4 pi lambda r t times, well, assume the density of states is it's constant, so, well, so we don't have an energy dependence in it. We'll pull it out of the integral. And now we have this integral of exp the minus and the minus q e0 minus ei squared over 4 lambda rt all over 1 plus exp to the minus q e i minus e all over rt d e i right and what I want to do is I want to evaluate that for when uh, minus q e0 equals minus q e. OK, that's just the, in other words, you apply a potential to the electrode that's equal to the standard potential of the redox couple in solution. And you can then measure the current, and clearly the current relates to this rate. So. In order to do this, I need to evaluate this. So I should define this integral times the whole thing. I won't write it. We'll just know what that is. OK. And to do this, I'm going to introduce I'm going to change my variable a little bit so it becomes more obvious. OK, I'm going to say let epsilon i equal minus q 
EI minus EF. Okay, that's really if uh, if I take my electrode and here's my Fermi energy and here's the level I, it's this distance. It's the energy difference between the i level and the Fermi level. And therefore, QEI is equal to QEF minus epsilon I. Mm, no. No, that's not right. Yeah, it must, it must be this. Even though my notes don't say it, that the notes have to be wrong. Okay, so we want to plug that all into our integral, and our integral will equal the prefactor all times 1 plus e to the epsilon i over kt. I mean, I call it epsilon i because I'm talking about the ith level, but then, of course, I integrate it over it, assuming the levels are basically continuous. So the i sort of subscript is sort of meaningless, but it's easy to keep in mind what you're talking about, so I leave it there. So this will be minus lambda. Oh, God, the signs look all wrong. Minus QE0, uh, and I plug this in. So this this is going to be minus Q plus epsilon squared over 4 lambda R2. D epsilon R. There's a Q, clearly, to convert between potential and stuff. Cause this was EI, and there's probably a minus sign, but that'll switch the limits. So I'm not worrying about any of that. Um, I don't like this. There's something the matter with my signs, and my signs here go back and forth, and so I'm not, not uh, clear where it's lost. Do you see where it's, I've lost? Plus. Oh, that make, that makes me very happy, very happy. Thank you. Okay, and I'm going to evaluate it where this is equal, where the f is equal to e zero. So these are going to cancel one another, and so now I have. And we're going to need to ask where the overlap is. Okay, now what we have, as I've drawn it now, our Fermi function occurs right where epsilon is zero. Well, this is zero, epsilon is going up here. And our peak occurs at uh, lambda, okay? And this width, which we say is the square root of 4 pi lambda RT, is also controlled by lambda. So even if I make lambda big, what I do is I increase this width and stuff. So the relationship, in a sense, stays the same, independent of lambda. And what I find, if you do this, is that the overlap is always right in here. That you're enough in the tail of the Gaussian that you haven't 
gone, gone I mean, you haven't gone to zero here, and the, the increase here basically gives you all the gap. So that the only place you get any overlap is for very small epsilon. That epsilon being up here equal to lambda, you know, the, yeah, the Fermi function wipes it out. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this and linearize it, and then I'll be able to integrate it. So I expand it, x squared minus 2x epsilon plus epsilon squared over 4 lambda rt, 1 plus e to the epsilon over rt. That this is a lambda. So what I've got x's here. So I can write this down as three terms, as a product of three terms. The first term is a, a function only, is not a function of epsilon. So I can take that out. So I get out of the integral, it's, it's going to be e to the minus lambda over 4rt times the integral, e to the minus, go ahead, I'm okay so far, I haven't gotten <laughs> screwed up the little signs yet, uh, e to the uh, epsilon over 2rt, e to the minus epsilon squared over 4 lambda rt, all divided by 1 plus e to the epsilon over rt, d epsilon. And there's that piece in front, the prefactor that I haven't written, the square root of 4 pi lambda rt. Okay. Okay, now, what I've said is I, basically, it's only epsilon values close to zero, so that piece I can throw out, because he's the smallest piece, and so now I get the integral times e to the minus epsilon over 2rt, 1 plus e to the epsilon over rt, d epsilon, and what I claim is you can integrate that, but just to show you can, if you divide uh, through by an epsilon, an epsilon of minus epsilon over 2it, the numerator and denominator, you get this is 1 over e to the minus epsilon over 2rt plus e to the plus epsilon over 2rt the epsilon, and everybody recognizes the denominator as the cosinch, right? 1 over, or 2 times the cosinch of, of epsilon over rt, right? Or epsilon over 2rt, which is it? Now, I've forgotten. The two, I think the 2 has to go in there. I don't know, do I? I don't know if I wrote that down. Now I got a sign wrong? I divide numerator and by. Right. Yeah, I know. The top is plus, and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's okay, right. So I, I divide the, the numerator by, denominator by e to the, or I multiply numerator and denominator by e to the minus epsilon over 2rt, and then the numerator goes to 1, yeah, so then it works. Okay, so this is the cosinch of the, and that you can integrate, and you get, uh, 
So, oh, now wait, I've lost a piece. He let me lose a piece. There's this piece I've lost over here. So this is a e to the minus lambda over 4 RT. So we have e to the minus lambda over 4 RT times uh, all over the square root of 4 pi lambda RT times pi k RT. The difference between R and K among friends we won't make, you know, we don't have to worry about. Uh, and so I get K0 is 4 pi squared over H, HAB squared times the square root of 4 pi lambda RT times pi KT, e to the minus lambda over for RT, and that turns out to be 2 pi squared over H, HAB squared times the square root of pi K RT over lambda, e to the minus lambda over RT, for RT. Okay, so I've actually can explicitly get a, a rate for the uh, for the reaction. Okay, so that's the standard rate. And I could do that for the other reaction too, but it clearly is just a, a repeat of all of that, so we won't do any of that. The last question to ask is about reorganization energies. We clearly say there's a reorganization energy. Uh, and we've basically attributed it mostly to the redox species, but there's some solvent problem, too. I mean, in the homogeneous reaction, we had the solvent polarized around the two species, and when we moved the electron, we had to repolarize the solvent. Well, here you have an electrode that's a metal electrode, okay, and you have some ion that approaches up to it, and the the solvent will be polarized in some way around this. And if you bring up a ion to a metal electrode, you can think of it as that you have a, a image charge behind the electrode at the same distance behind that the charge is in front. And so you can work that out and where do I have it? Somewhere I've even worked it out. Or should I say, somewhere Rudy Marcus worked it out. And so if we say the outer sphere for a metal electrode is going to be delta Q squared over 4 pi epsilon 0, all times 1 over 2A1 minus 1 over 2D times 1 over D op minus 1 over ds, where A1 is the radius of the ion, and D is the distance from the ion to its image charge, which is, if we define this distance as r, D is equal to 2r. Okay. It's quite persistently in the literature written as to 2d, although clearly d is sort of a uh, hypothetical distance. The d op is, again, the optical dielectric constant, which is usually taken as the square of the refractive index, and ds is the static dielectric constant. So if I say that this can approach the electrode reasonably intimately so that, uh, so that D is equal to uh, 2A, 1. Then I get, at close contact, times, uh, this will be 1 over 4A1. I think so. OK, 
k, which I could rewrite as 1 over half times delta q squared over 4. Now, if you recall, for the solution, Allen sphere for the solution, or for the homogeneous in solution, we wrote down as delta q squared over 4 pi epsilon 0 times 1 over 2a1 plus 1 over 2a2 minus 1 over r times 1 over d op minus 1 over ds. And this was for two ions in solution, a1, a2 radius, and the distance between them was r. And if we do close contact and we assume the ions are the same, we say a1 equals a2 and r equals 2a1. A, then we can work this out, and this is delta Q squared over 4 pi epsilon 0 times. These two add up as two of these. This is 1 over 2A that subtracts, so it's a 1 over 2A times 1 over D op minus 1 over DS. And so that lambda outer for solution is equal to, or uh, one half of lambda outer of solution is equal to lambda outer at the metal electrode. Okay. Likewise, we can say lambda in has a relationship. Lambda in at the metal electrode is one half lambda out in solution because for the metal electrode you have one ion that's reorganizing, whereas in solution you have two ions reorganizing. So, half. so overall, lambda for the metal electrode is is usually approximately one half lambda of the solution value. Okay, and now we have a little bit to say about SAMs, and then we're all done. Okay, so now we've talked about the reorganization. Now, you can write relationships between the rate constant in solution and the rate constant at the, ele the standard rate constant at the electrode, if you want, uh, and that's often done, but uh, I'll leave that leave that out because I want to make one remark about SAMs. And now at the electrode, oh wait, oh uh, yeah, okay, All, well two remarks. These rate constants I've written at electrode are all for a molecule basically at a distance from the electrode. I haven't talked really about the problem of diffusion toward the electrode or any of that. So if you want to worry about that, that has to be worried about somewhat separately. But there's a, a, a large class of, a large uh, cottage industry of work that takes a uh, metal electrode, generally a gold electrode, and puts a self-assembled monolayer on it. These are usually alkane thiols, so they have sulfurs that will bond to the metal electrode. And what they have is one in, I don't know, 10 or 100 of these capped with a redox active species, and they can very well uh, characterize the SAM, and they can say quite well that it's nice and densely packed and it's all stacked at a particular angle. And then by changing the number of alkane units in, they can measure the rate constant for electron transfer, and they can get a distance dependence of electron transfer. And so it's a one way of, of getting this beta value and for this work, the betas you get for saturated alkanes are about 1.1, if you want, uh, angstroms to the minus 1. And if you, if as you might expect, if you make these aromatic and you make them planar, the beta goes way down because you can transfer distances much further. And if you make them uh, so that you 
Well, then there's other work that has measured beta in solutions that don't have uh, full chains, and then the beta gets worse. And so there's a whole industry of measuring and characterizing beta that's been done, and uh, much of it on electrodes has been very helpful. OK, I think that's where we should end. Uh, maybe I just should give an, an advertisement there. You can now do all of this stuff on semiconductor electrodes. And there are many differences and special things about that in semiconductor electrodes. But you'll have to take Nate's course to get any of that. I have the